Welcome to today's lecture and discussion. My name is Kevin Featherstone and I'm director of the Hellenic Observatory here at the London School of Economics. Today's event is part of a series of lectures that we hold in association with the National Bank of Greece. And the series is aimed at looking at international issues from a variety of perspectives to compare experiences and to share knowledge. And in this respect, I'd like to thank Costas Mekalides and Pavlos Milonas from the National Bank of Greece for their continuing support. It's a pleasure to be joining uh, them on this shared platform. This lecture also complements other LSE events under the uh, title Shaping the Post-COVID World. Today, our focus is on changing urban life in different international uh, settings. In our lifetimes, our cities have grown and developed at pace. Density of our cities, problems of providing an appropriate infrastructure, of managing socioeconomic inequalities, of safeguarding our environment, of providing of changing needs. All of these issues have accumulated to focus on international attention uh, the challenges of our urban life and developmental models. Of course, for the last year, many of our cities have been denuded of their key ingredient, people. As such, their vibrancy and their interactions uh, have been much less than we can previously uh, recall. We're experiencing different kinds of lockdown. We've seen a flight from the city as workers sit in front of their computers and connect uh, from their homes. Our public space has been transformed. It's become digital and global. All of this prompts us to rethink some of our assumptions about the urban age. Without the pandemic restrictions, we would actually be holding this lecture today in Athens, a very appropriate location for our discussion. It's a city of over 3 million people in a country of around 11 million people. Athens underwent major changes prior to the 2004 Olympic Games, but today it faces new challenges. The main speaker today is well placed to combine the international and the local. Wiki Burdett, Professor of Urban Studies at the LSE and Director of LSE Cities, a global centre uh, for research and teaching. Wiki co-directs our Urban Age Programme and its task force. He's been a visiting professor at Harvard at uh, New York University. He has a list of practical engagements. Chief Advisor on Architecture and Urbanism for the London Olympics of 2012, director of the Venice International Architecture Viennale, curator of a global cities uh, exhibition at Tate Modern in London, and a trustee of the Norman Foster Foundation. He is a regular consultant to national and city governments around the world. And of special interest today is that he's leading a new venture the LSE City of Athens Urban Age Task Force. And we look forward to Ricky explaining the aims and the purpose of this new task force. To respond to Ricky's lecture, we're delighted to have three distinguished speakers. Kostas Bakoyanis is mayor of the city of Athens. He's been governor of the central Greece region and mayor of Karpenisi. Dr. Bakoyanis holds a PhD from the University of Oxford, having previously studied at Brown University and Harvard University in the United States. Dr. Bakoyanis is a member of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. As mayor of Athens, he is supporting the LSE Athens Urban Age Task Force. Mila Leontidou is Professor Emerita of Geography and European Culture at the Hellenic Open University, EAP. She's held senior positions in many Greek universities and also at King's College London. 
Leela has published some 250 books and papers in Greek, English, and French. And her work has been translated into Spanish, Italian, German, and Japanese. Leela is also a past visiting professorial fellow at the Hellenic Observatory here at the LSE. And we look forward to her comments on the international changes we're experiencing in urban life. To broaden our perspective even further, we're pleased to welcome Yorgos Petrakos, an economist and a professor at the Department of Planning and Regional Development at the University of Thessaly. Indeed, Yorgos is a former rector of that university. He's a past vice president of the European Regional Science Association and a member of the Council of the Regional Science Association International. George is a former Secretary General in the Ministry of Economy and Development. His research interests include urban and regional economics, developments, structural change, integration, and regional policy. Now, I know many of our LSE alumni in Greece will be watching us today, and I extend a very warm welcome to each of you, especially to the new Board of Governors of the uh, Alumni Association in Athens. Our discussion today is being live streamed on Facebook. We also plan to upload a podcast of the discussion uh, for you to download uh, later. Many of you will be watching or downloading this discussion from different parts of the world. Recently, I've been chairing LSE uh, panel discussions, and we've been delighted to have participants joining us from Africa, Asia, North America, almost all parts of the globe. You're all very welcome. We invite you as you're uh, following the discussion, we invite you to share your comments on Twitter and the hashtag is hashtag LSE COVID-19. As you're following the discussion, can I suggest that you send us your questions and you can do that by looking at the bottom of your screen if you're joining us on Zoom and clicking on the Q&A icon uh, and you can send us your questions through that facility. Simply give us your name, your affiliation if you have one and tell us where you're uh, joining us from. It would be nice to know. And above all, please, please keep your questions very short. I will read them out later and it's a lot easier if those questions are very, very short, please. Okay, so we have a, a great panel, um, a very timely uh, topic, and let's uh, therefore begin. In a moment, I'm going to invite Ricky Burdett uh, to address us. After that, I'll invite Professor Leon Tivo, Professor Petrakos, and the mayor to respond and then we'll follow up with your questions and we'll have a discussion. So, uh, to get started, let me pass to Ricky Bedet. Ricky. Kevin, thank you for the introduction and I'm delighted to join such a distinguished group of uh, colleagues, academics, practitioners and policymakers. I'm going to try and do two things in my talk, is give a bit of an overview of what's happened and happening today and has been happening in cities for some time and make some reflections on very recent work that we started doing uh, together with uh, again colleagues in Athens on the city and much of what I'm going to say is drawn from the research that we've done over the last 15-20 years at our organization LSC Cities particularly under the banner of a joint enterprise with the German foundation AHG under the name of the urban age. And it's through that, in fact, that uh, exactly a year ago, Costas, we signed with our director, Minou Shafiq, an agreement to collaborate on a number of issues that I will be talking about shortly. But let me try and start by setting the context, as I say, of why cities are as important as they've ever been in the history of mankind. 
And there are two ways of looking at that. And I think the members of the panel will recognize this. One is purely in terms of economic development. What you see here is a world map and in the circles, the size of the population, the larger it is, the more millions they are. And in the darker colors, obviously this is before uh, the 2020 pandemic, in the darker colors, the rate of GDP growth and forecast over the future. And you can see from this image already a disproportion distribution across the world. Asia and Africa are where economic growth is happening and fueling urbanization. There are parts of Europe, we'll come back to that, North America and Latin America, which either slowed down or reversed. Even more significant is the growth in population numbers. The two are not exactly parallel, but very close in many parts of the world. And these numbers here represent the number of people who are either born or move into one of these cities that you see there per minute. So, for example, in Lagos 56, every minute that we are all talking to you, to this very global audience, one person is either born or moved into Lagos. So think of what that means in terms of the provision of sanitation, infrastructure, hospitals, housing, and anything else. So it's not just a question of speed of change, it's a question of scale, and also what you see from this map, again, is an unequal distribution geographically with Asia, Africa being at a higher speed than they ever been. What happens in the bounce after 2021, the pandemic is of course to be discussed and we will talk about that later. But uh, there are parts of the world that you see in the central upper part of the screen in this area over here, parts of the Rust Belt of the United States where actually populations have reversed. People have left to follow jobs. And of course, and uh, I'm sure the mayor may agree or disagree with these numbers is of course changing in the decade between the last two censuses in uh, Greece, the number of people in Athens itself actually dropped quite significantly. So picking up on uh, the issue of demographic growth and economic growth, without these two elements, cities face great difficulties uh, and uh, there is need to, in a way, recharge them, particularly after the pandemic, in terms of attracting jobs, attracting people back to want to live in cities. We'll come back to that. But I want to stress for a few minutes this issue <clears throat> of how unequal growth actually is affecting the globe. Pardon for that. Uh, but also what environmental and social consequences are. 2.5 billion more people will be living in cities by 2050. That's not that far away. And 90% of that will happen in Asia or Africa. At the moment, uh, countries and cities, of course, within them, which in some cases are low energy, and in some cases have relatively low level economies. All of that is obviously set to change. So the question is for academics, for policymakers, for practitioners, is which choice do we make? And of course, this will become a clear dis, um, discussion when we talk with our colleagues and with the mayor in a moment. So if one looks at this chart that we've done at LSE Cities of where uh, cities over 400,000 are growing without going into detail, but it's cities like Dar es Salaam, Luanda, Lagos, we saw before, Kinshasa, Abidjan, and some Chinese cities where the growth is at its most extreme. But what is the pattern underlying this, uh, the two main axes of the discussion that I want to stress and we can go back to later. One is social and the other is environmental. One out of every three, just think of that in a Zoom page or people sitting next to you, if you were sitting next to someone in an auditorium, one out of every three new urban citizens will be living without basic infrastructure. You can call it a slum, you can call it an informal settlement, a favela, but without access to the basic needs. Clearly, there's a time bomb ticking there if that concentration grows. And on the environmental side, I think there are two aspects. Cities consume something like 60% of global energy, 
Of course, that's where people come to make things, to do things, to move, uh, to exchange idea and transact. But as a result, they create 75% or so of the world's CO2 emissions. It depends where you are in the world. But the good news, I think, and since cities are hubs of innovation, the good news is that a relatively small reduction in the environmental footprint, and every mayor knows this, of their city can make quite a significant difference to the planet. So we're talking about local and global uh, dynamics actually linked together. Just to, again, put things in context as to how much stuff is actually built, being built there. The USA used this very large number of gigatons of cement in a whole century. China's used more of that in only two or three years of a decade or so ago. And in cities like Guangzhou, which you can see here, yes, the population grow, grew by something like a thousand percent in 25 years, but its footprint expanded by nearly three and a half thousand percent. So there are issues of sprawl, there are issues of uh, sustainability, which come into the picture. Because unlike Athens, unlike other cities, particularly in the European context, many cities are growing like this. That image of Kinshasa, completely uncontrolled growth, horizontal sprawl with incredibly negative consequences in terms of stretching services, stretching infrastructure, water systems, and of course, promoting fossil fuel dependent car use. Now, Mexico City, 22 million, one of the largest in the world, has three or four hour commuting times a day, if one can believe that. Athens is not that bad, I know, but sometimes even this city has very severe problems of pollution despite its density. Now, this whole situation has been exacerbated, one could say, by climate change, refugees, people fleeing areas which have either in drought or have been flooding, and they go where? They go to cities where, in some cases, there are more at risk. And in the uh, Greek, European context, the unprecedented pressures of what's happened because of man-made disasters on cities is, of course, an issue that everyone is still having to deal with and Greece in particular. Who would have imagined in charge of Berlin, Athens, uh, and uh, many other cities in uh, this sphere of Europe, that one would have to accommodate refugees in temporary situations or for the longer term. And this gets to the heart of certainly one of the key points that our work at LSE Cities has focused on for decades and will continue to, is the issue of inequality. Can one design cities that are more unequal than on, on, on others? And the answer is yes, and I use the word design. This image of a favela uh, on the left in the city of São Paulo uh, at a time of the boom in the Brazilian economy meant that uh, a private developer built housing for middle-class families where they were so wealthy that they had a swimming pool on each terrace, while on the left-hand side, basic infrastructure, including water, was often lacking. I am an optimist about cities, and I'm convinced, and it's happening, that the left-hand side of this picture will, at a certain change, through government interventions, through subsidies, through education, and much more. But it's the wall between these two that will keep people separate and therefore exacerbate inequality. And we've done a lot of mapping of uh, cities, whether it's London, Rio, Hong Kong, and in a moment I'll turn to uh, Athens as well, to actually show where there are concentrations of deprivation. Now, this is not just a piece of statistics. It's a piece of social policy because it's up to each national, regional, and I would say metropolitan leader to try and deal with these issues on the ground and avoid a concentration or over-concentration of inequality in some areas, which you can see, there it is. In Rio de Janeiro, the West is extremely poor. The East, particularly along the fabulous waterfront, is instead uh, very different and very low levels of deprivation. London, the city that Kevin and I work in and live in, has its own dynamic. And what you can see here, it's just bear it in mind a moment, is that in dark red, is the higher levels of deprivation, that means less education, lower life expectancy, and then green, exactly the opposite, is the area to the east. 
and a bit to the north, which has been for decades highly deprived. Why am I showing this? And I'm showing this as a sort of piece of deep analysis, while other sort of um, academics with a sense of humor have uh, maybe painted a simpler picture of how uh, London actually works. But at the heart of this is an issue that each city encodes underneath the surface different levels of deprivation for different groups, whether it's ethnic, whether it's income, whether it's age. And I think to uncover that is part of the role of also academics like ourselves represented at this event and to talk to the people who make decisions on the ground. So when it came about a decade plus uh, ago for London to bid for the Olympic Games, they chose to place it there in this part, it's called Stratford in East London, which is the single most deprived area of London. If you're going to spend public money and infrastructure, it's not a bad idea to do it that way. And as a result of that, an area which was cut off from its surroundings, uh, ex-railway yards, is now becoming a place with nearly 20,000 homes, of which 48% are affordable, a large number of jobs. But of course, this doesn't mean that everyone's happy. And I think we need to come back to that when we think about how we rebuild or uh, take advantage of what's happened in the last year with pan the pandemic and build more sustainable and equal cities. Athens, of course, has its own patterns of inequality and it's the great work of Professor Malutas and his colleagues in the Athens Social Atlas, which has allowed us at LSE Cities to begin to map uh, some of these differences. We don't need to go into detail. Uh, all three of you who will follow me know this much better than I do. But the darker red again shows where there's a concentration. Broadly speaking, the Western corridor and the Northern extremes outside Attica are more deprived and that within the city itself, that is duplicated with a difference between East and West. In that sense, not that different from London. But one mustn't think about cities only on their own and this uh, raises the issue of regional and even global connection, which is so important to the economy of these cities, as George will point out in a moment. But of course, it's this very connectivity, airports in particular, which led to the pandemic, which started exactly a year ago. Each city has responded in different ways. And there is no one size fits all in terms of either the cause or the way of dealing with. The numbers, of course, we know are incredibly stark. In Europe, there's been attempts to analyze by some colleagues at the LSE uh, what the patterns are between excess mortality and different spatial patterns. And basically, uh, there isn't one. But one thing is clear, and I think this is important in discussing what happens post pandemic, is that areas of ethnic concentration and inequality uh, and concentration of poverty and deprivation have been worse hit practically in every city around the world than others. Here's the city of, the New, of New York, uh, which you can see Manhattan and Central Park in the middle. Uh, the denser areas are shown here in dark uh, and the COVID cases on the map on the right are also shown in dark. In fact, the concentration of mortality and disease spread are not in the denser areas as one might imagine, but actually in the areas with Afro-American and Latino concentration. So it's these sorts of environments which have been hit. They've been unequal for a long time. And for many decades, I think policymakers at different levels have failed to deal with the issue. Perhaps this is one of the legacies of what happens next that we need to understand. So let me move to that. Suddenly we've all realized that parks are important and they're democratic for fresh air, for mental health. Which cities are being planned in the way London was 100, uh, three, 200 years ago at the time that Regent's Park was created? Athens has this potential, and I know that the mayor and his colleagues are beginning to look at what might happen to some of the green spaces, the green lungs uh, that are there in one of the densest cities in Europe. So what is coming out of the pandemic is consolidation of some very strong ideas. In Paris, there's the concept of the 15-minute city. Basically, you can work live, do your core shopping, even get sort of cultural entertainment within a 15 more minute walk or cycle ride. Now, this was such a powerful, strong, very European idea 
that Anne Hidalgo, who's there cycling in the middle of that picture, was re-elected on this campaign ticket only last summer. And the city is spending something like 300 million euros on new, new cycleways since then. The city of Milan, run by Mayor Beppe Sala, is doing similar things. They're building on the opportunity uh, that the pandemic, in a way, has provided to create um, 35 kilometers of cycleways, but also these rather simple images of what they call piazze aperte, open squares under this notion of tactical urbanism. You don't need big long-term plans which take 10 years to approve uh, and uh, technicians to confirm. You can just try things overnight and if they work, they work. If not, they don't. And uh, I'm sure uh, the Great Walk experience is part of that experiment. And as we know, there's been a transition, an extraordinary change in the United States. Who would have expected the US Transportation Secretary, Pete Buttigieg now, to talk about walkability in a country which is determined by the image or described by the image we see on the left. The Great Walk, of course, fits into that and we'll hear more about it. Now, none of these issues, none of these issues can be addressed in a post-pandemic world without getting governance right. And I want to talk about that for a few minutes and then conclude with some of the work we're doing on Athens and on the Urban Task Force together. These two maps show London on the left within a pink line, the jurisdiction of the mayor, where he has power, where people vote for him. And in the gray, where people live and pay taxes and work. And you can see that roughly speaking, the pink line aligns with what is known in London as the M25 motorway, the Green Belt, which by design concentrated development. That's a planning idea which started in 1943. In New York, there's where the mayor, Bill de Blasio, has power. But in gray, you can see that the functional area extends way beyond uh, those area, the, the area where the mayor has jurisdiction. So it's not by chance that, in fact, who spoke about the pandemic? It was the governor of the state of New York and not Bill de Blasio, simply because they had the powers to deal with much of the population. In London, we have a different situation where three different mayors, and let's remember, we invented the system of a directly elected mayor in 2020, so 21 years ago uh, today. And all of them have had responsibility for a number of things, including, as you can see from this diagram, in red here, which is where their powers are, including public transport. I think anyone who talks about sustainability and anyone who talks about also post-pandemic equity and sustainability knows that control of the budget for public transport, let alone planning powers, is critical. And that's why London was able to introduce a congestion chart. Every single person advised Mayor Livingston at the time, not a good idea, you'll be voted out of office. That's not what happened. And in fact, this year, something called the ultra low emission zone will be implemented in the whole of London, reducing its environmental footprint for the better, really significant. This is the same diagram of powers in New York. And in yellow, you suddenly see something new compared to London. And it's the power of the state of New York. And they are responsible for many things, including transport. And that's one of the reasons perhaps there hasn't been that level of investment. Now, anyone who studies Athens, Attica, and the regional, local, and national powers, and who decides what, are aware that similar issues exist in terms of debating the future arrangements of the city. And I think that equity, sustainability, better democratic accountability can only uh, also be accomplished with the right uh, jurisdiction and organization structure. The mayor of Paris at the moment is discussing these very issues uh, with uh, the central government and the president. So what amongst many other things can a efficiently run city actually deal with? Well, one is this question that Kevin already alluded to, which is density. Now density is a very technical term, often used by planners and no one really knows what it means, but it's how close people live together. How uh, do you avoid sprawl and therefore make maximum use of every single 
form of civic and public service, schools, hospitals, uh, and obviously public transport amongst them. But just bringing people together means that they can exchange knowledge, exchange ideas and transact. That's what cities are about. And that is what, of course, has been challenged so deeply under the pandemic, even though there are clear patterns of things are coming back. The relationship between density and public transport efficiency is very, very clear. So if you take these six cities, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Mumbai, Sao Paulo, Istanbul, and London, and look at their relative densities, you can see, and we all know that Hong Kong is very dense. The taller the stick, the higher the density. And you can see that London is actually not particularly dense compared to these other cities. But look at what happens in terms of public transport use. In Hong Kong, the sheer fact that everyone is so close together and there is a good public transport system, amazing public transport system, funded by the government, 93% of people take public transport and you can see the percentages everywhere else. So let me move and conclude on talking about Athens in these last few minutes. Unfortunately, and these figures obviously have improved, I think slightly or may have changed, but around 10 uh, years ago when the last census was taken, uh, the private car use in the Athens and Athens regions is actually much higher, let's say, than it should be for a sustainable city. So there's a lot that can be done given your climate, given your uh, natural assets in terms of green and in terms of the water to improve walking and cycling, even though you have hills, of course, and steeper uh, conditions. So when one talks about working together on the LSE Athens Urban Age Task Force, it's exactly this range of issues that we're interested in discussing. First of all, you can't talk about Athens without looking at it at least at the scale at which this airplane photograph was taken. So we will be creating a social and spatial compendium of Athens and comparing it to other 17 cities. And we will be <clears throat> working together with different university groups and the mayor's office and specialists on understanding what is the best way to enhance walkability, greening and the quality of public space. Just, I want to conclude with a few statistics to keep in mind and uh, a few images of the sort of early work that we're doing. The city of Athens, and I referred to this earlier, has pretty uniquely uh, amongst the bigger cities in, in, in Europe, but not all, dropped in population in certainly the last years. Now, the result of the economic crisis and more has affected it significantly and things of course are picking up. And it's interesting to see how the Attica region in the last decade again has remained relatively stable. The fact that the foreign born population is significant but not as large as elsewhere uh, is mass or doesn't reflect the issue of the refugees, which of course has been dramatic in terms of using, can I say that, Athens as a sort of throughput uh, and drawing on its uh, resources and much else. But again, when it comes to where Athens is going to go next, the fact that the wider metropolitan area punches enormously above its weight in terms of economic contribution to national GDP, say compared to London or even more so than Berlin, is very, very significant. So coming to the final points about, you know, what really matters about Athens and what needs to be preserved and made more of is its density. I see that as an asset, not a negative. If you compare Athens to uh, many of these other cities in Europe and elsewhere, Barcelona in particular, and its transport system, you see a very, very clear pattern. Again, the taller spikes show where the greater density is, but there is great opportunity for improving uh, the quality of access to public space and green space, but also the use of getting from A to B, because the distances are not large, by walking and cycling and using more public transport. Just look at these figures in terms of the density. I know the numbers themselves don't mean very much, but it's three times as dense as London three and four times as dense in Berlin. And it's actually as dense overall in terms of numbers as Singapore. The last slides to show, just to put things in context, is new work that I've been doing with my colleagues at um, LSC Cities and in, um, here in, in, in Athens uh, um, also, is using new data to actually 
see where the economic power of uh, Athens itself is laid out. And you can see that uh, center towards east and center towards south and towards the airport, there's a strong concentration of both public jobs and private jobs. And the relationship between the public spaces where people work and where people live is being also studied by these maps which show the quality and the positioning of different uh, public spaces and neighborhoods. And of course, finally, where uh, green spaces are located and perhaps could be better accessed by many of the communities, not only immediately around them, but other parts of the city itself. So I end with two slides. One is a reminder that Athens, like any other city in the world, is one that has suffered from uh, um, a <clears throat> degree of inequality, which is spatialized. That has been undoubtedly exacerbated by the pandemic, we'll hear more. But <clears throat> there are opportunities as we go forward to rebalance social equity and well-being of the population, that this must build on the high density, well-connected, mixed use sort of DNA of European cities, but this must require changing urban lifestyles, giving more importance to the public realm, investing in high quality environment and making use of natural assets. Now, no one in charge of a city, whether it's the mayor of London that I've advised for a number of years or others, has to think that the project of dealing with cities is finite. It's an ongoing process. Cities are iterative, they're always incomplete. So there's never a wrong moment not to intervene. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ricky, very much indeed. That's a wonderfully uh, broad and insightful uh, presentation. And we'll try to keep in mind both the international aspect and also, of course, the implications for uh, planning and urban renewal in Athens. Let me now pass on to our three uh, respondents and uh, invite, first of all, uh, Lila, Lila Leontidu to make her comments. Lila. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to this distinguished panel. It's an honor and a privilege. Uh, and now given the impressive scope of Professor Bardet, I would say that uh, we can uh, select three mega trends uh, shaping cities. Uh, in my presentation, globalization, digitization, and uh, urbanization. And suddenly, uh, in 2020, the pandemic was thrust into our lives as a major fourth me major megatrend. So uh, urbanization at, its, uh, uh, at this stage seems to be the least resilient of them. Uh, the tw after 2020, the pandemic undermined uh, the urban age that we're living in. And uh, what has been taken for granted is threatened by contagion, lockdowns, and population departures. In a recent article, I have considered the city as the geographical collateral damage of COVID-19. The very idea of the city is uh, fading somehow because the city is actually not bricks and mortar. It is constituted by human interaction, society, community. And uh, this uh, is a kind of uh, dead landscape that we are living in now during lockdowns. Bankrupt businesses, closed doors, empty piazzas, ghost towns, as the Rolling Stones sang so recently. Uh, the prof the um, uh, philosopher Deramo wrote in the New Left Review uh, dedication that uh, the current epidemic looks more like a neutron bomb which kills humans and leaves buildings, roads and factories intact if empty. So when the epidemic is over, there will be nothing to rebuild and no consequent recovery, he said. Now, how did we come to this? The short 21st century was full of surprises Remember the optimism of the 20th century, the last years with Europeanization, uh, illustrated so beautifully in publications of the Hellenic Observatory and our chair here, Professor Featherstone. Uh, Brexit muted this optimism. And then uh, in Greece, 
it was uh, the euphoria of the Olympics 2004 that uh, is the last step of optimism. Then the image was dramatically re uh, reversed in the 2010s. Austerity, crisis, and uh, uh, poverty, and uh, unemployment. Uh, when this was hardly overcome, the pandemic struck, and COVID-19 is contaminating not only people, but also geographies, except as we have heard, climate change, which is uh, looking up somehow. We tend to hope that the footprint of the pandemic on cities will be ephemeral, but uh, really uncertainties are very large and, in, and uh, societies are in a mess. Uh, I was trying to come across uh, some permanent effects of the pandemic on the urban network and urbanization and regionalism in the Mediterranean context and came across nine main points which I want to, to tell you, to, to present to you in very, very um, summary uh, condition, <laughs> uh, the development. The first one is digitization, which is the most important permanent outcome of the pandemic. The ICT will always define interaction as well as social inequalities. It uh, preceded the pandemic, of course, but now it is very, very uh, disseminated. People are getting used to simulacra. Today we are simulating a seminar, an event which used to be collective. We cannot see our audience. We cannot get feedback from their eyes and their whispers. This is individuation, our small separate cells and grids. We are united in isolation. In the city, we have to bear distancing from our friends and lose completely those casual friendships we used to meet in public spaces. This was the essence of the city. In the future, this may develop into a hybrid situation, online and offline at the same time. Now, the second permanence that we could uh, claim is digitization also linked with the menacing impact of the pandemic, surveillance and repression. Uh, it is actually a, a kind of uh, society of science fiction, which is uh, happening for a gamben, the coronavirus response demonstrates a tendency to use the state of exception as a normal paradigm of government. And in the same New Left Review special issue, Deramo says that lockdown, in lockdowns, we are witnessing a gigantic and unprecedented experiment in social discipline, a, a dystopia of Orwellian proportions, whereon the pandemic becomes a pretext for new legislation, policing everyday life. Uh, this spills over to police states and uh, in fact, within universities in Greece, police will come to, to discipline people. So democracy is wounded in this sense. Now, the third permanent feedback uh, feature is inequalities growing between enterprises profiting from lockdowns and digitization in the north and traditional ones closing down in the global south the Mediterranean loses its sizable informal sector. So the north-south divide deepens. A fourth uh, permanent feature, social inequality in each city, which Professor Bardet showed so, uh, so visually also, deepens on many fronts between people losing their jobs and livelihoods in crisis and the winners of global lockdowns. Uh, the digital divide among households, access to basic services, especially health, and of course, unequal housing size and amenities, which in uh, lockdowns becomes, becomes very conspicuous, like uh, the homeless and, their poor, and the poor cannot probably stay home or uh, work from home. Uh, the, the jargon does not uh, take them into account. Now, the fifth permanence about the pandemic, indeed shaping cities, concerns land use, changes in urban geography and land use. Ghost cities are wastelands of empty properties, 
abandoned by bankrupt enterprises and by citizens unable to keep their homes, becoming homeless. A sort of uh, desertification of urban space, awaiting the invasion of new activities. For example, commercial and urban land use, which is uh, impoverished, may give way to residential spaces for home working or health services or delivery shops. Uh, the most striking example, since we talked about Rio de Janeiro before, is the spectacular Samba Drome of Rio converted into a vaccination center. Temporary, hopefully, but for how long? How long is the temporary now? Now, the sixth permanence at the metropolitan scale is the urban public sphere collapsing as a space of communication, congregation, deliberation, as a condition for democracy. Parks close down, strolling in piazzas is prohibited. The opportunity of some governments to intervene comes into view. In Athens, the pandemic became the pretext to treat urban public space as a playground, as a big walk or a big promenade with policies for decoration, some dubious design and some dubious uh, results, actually. It has been criticized, but I don't want to uh, tread into the mayor's uh, domain. He will talk to us about this. Uh, in any case, seafronts and urban hills are privatized with intransparent procedures, and a lot is happening in the empty city. The government takes charge of it. Now, the seventh permanence, the locational freedom offered by digitization uh, facilitates two interlinked pro uh, processes, which I will uh, present as uh, the eighth and the uh, ninth permanence. The eighth one is literalization. It used to appear seasonally with tourism, and uh, it became more permanent in the 1990s with residential tourism, uh, which brought several Northern European uh, property holders into the Mediterranean countryside. Now the pandemic blocks such movements. It discourages traveling and long-term planning of vacations and tourism. It uh, permits society with a mentality of insecurity, uncertainty, and it hits seasonal tourism. So it might well encourage permanent decentralized living, which is feasible in the Mediterranean coastlines with digitization. And the ninth connected uh, permanence could be counter-urbanization or the slowing down. Well, um, counter-urbanization has a long history since the 1980s. But COVID-based processes are very different from those of the years of the industrialization and so on, mainly in the north. Now they are also affecting the south. The claustrophobia created by uh, lockdowns created traffic jams in London, Paris and Athens. Just a little before the impositions of lockdowns, frustrated citizens were fleeing from their city homes. Uh, to, to avoid another lockdown within the dense and compact city and go to the countryside. Now, the question is, will they return? Some of them will, some of them not, uh, by discussions, of course, because we don't have any data yet. So to conclude, the city will not be extinct, of course, but it will change radically. Resilience must be strengthened through policy for social welfare and infrastructure, especially for, for transport, uh, with uh, adaptable urban policy rather than design blueprints, with international networking among cities for exchange of knowledge rather than place marketing. Professor Burdett's flexible incremental urbanism is on the agenda more than ever. And uh, actually, uh, because there, there uh, we come full circle to our beginning, arguing that after 2020, our urban age, which has been taken for granted for so long, is undermined by the pandemic. That's all, thank you very much.
Thank you, Leela, very much indeed. Uh, you've given us uh, a number of points to uh, be concerned uh, about there. Uh, I'm not quite sure that it was optimistic, but certainly a number of points of uh, challenge. Orwellian uh, image. Uh, Orwellian. Uh, yeah, um, concerningly uh, so, and our, particularly our sense of public space and how that is changing with the COVID pandemic as well. So thank you, Leela. Uh, Yogo. Mm, uh, thank you, Kevin. And uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, I'm very happy to participate in this uh, panel. I think now you can see my presentation, right? Uh, well, I will start saying that uh, Professor Burdett made a very stimulating uh, presentation. Uh, of course, in line with his impressive recent book, uh, highlighting uh, with a critical approach many of the problems and issues arising uh, in the cities today. Um, uh, in my short intervention, I would like to contribute to the discussion about the effects of the pandemic on cities, like uh, Lila did before, uh, from the economic geography point of view. I will uh, look quickly um, at the major drivers of urban growth and the major challenges uh, faced by cities today, and I will discuss how the pandemic may affect and reshape the footprint. Um, in, uh, in short, uh, the major drivers of urban growth are technological revolution and ICT that increase accessibility and connectivity, offering locational freedom, but distracting also employment in traditional sectors, globalization and integration that make mobile capital an important driver of growth, expand trade and specialization, and trigger internal and external migration. Agglomeration economies that provide benefits of scale and interaction to larger cities, market size and geography, offering home market effects and accessibility to other large markets, public policy that provides critical resources for infrastructure, uh, human capital and services, but often needs a more balanced mix of top-down and place-based policies, and finally, uh, climate change that sets new challenges to cities related to sustainability and uh, planning. Uh, again, in short, the major challenges to the urban development model uh, are related to economic crisis that affects production, demand and employment in, uh, in the cities. At balanced growth, uh, triggering migration flows and pressure in infrastructure, labor and housing markets in advanced high density cities and depopulating the weaker one. Uh, structural change that is driven by disruptive technologies, but also growing competition. Social divides and spatial uh, segregation accruing from significant differences in access to labor markets within cities and implying that the poor find it more difficult to get decent housing at affordable prices. Negative externalities implying that high density areas may be faced with congestion, pollution, uh, crime and pressure on public land and urban sprawl that consumes limited natural resources and requires additional transport infrastructure and public services. Now, uh, what is, uh, how is the pandemic going to affect these drivers and challenges? Uh, uh, it is, it is uh, expected to leave uh, a footprint on uh, cities, uh, first through the impact on technological revolution. ICT becomes the major driver of uh, industrial transformation in cities, trying to protect citizens uh, from, uh, uh, from the viruses and, uh, uh, and delivers automations and contactless technologies that affect production lines, commercial activity, construction, and services. In addition, it makes proximity to a large extent digital for a number of sectors and functions, allowing smaller places to participate in higher order functions previously confined within metro areas. ICT makes Telework in a key mode of employment, reducing the need to travel between work and home, and uh, makes skilled labor 
largely footloose, increasing the importance of the quality of the urban environment as a location factor for human capital. On the other hand, the pandemic has caused a major setback in the process of globalization that may affect negatively open cities due to the decline of global investment and trade and the return of the borders. Uh, uh, it may uh, shift policy attention from competitive to resilient cities and require that uh, the EU policies get a more proactive uh, turn uh, uh, and an expansionary fiscal policy in order to maintain uh, economic and uh, political cohesion. Uh, the pandemic uh, primarily restricts human interaction and therefore it affects urban densities. It implies that scale and agglomeration diseconomies this time uh, may appear in high density metropolitan areas due to the risk of contagion in workplaces, high rise housing, mass transport and marketplaces. Diseconomies may act in favor of satellite and smaller cities as safer living and working places and favor the emergence of a more network type form of external economies of scale. The pandemic will also speed up ICT-related structural adjustments as commerce will be mostly electronic, questioning the future of large shopping malls and setting significant challenges to city centers that may face pressures for renewal. While at the same time, logistics will expand and may occupy uh, part of the vacant space emerging from the decline of shopping malls. At the same time, Mass production manufacturing will speed up, will speed up the replacement of labor with robotics and automation and become to a large extent footloose. Uh, it is expected that cities investing in ICT and bio industries will develop a new basis for competitive, competitiveness and growth, while cities unable to do that will face difficulties to adjust their production model and deal with structural unemployment. Uh, the pandemic will most likely increase uh, social divides and spatial segregation as weaker social groups may find it more difficult to protect themselves from the viruses and the crisis, while the emerging ICT-led division of labor may have fewer places for their unskilled increasing divides. Unemployed people will face a more hostile environment in their housing and living conditions, while new enclaves of poverty may be formed by the new urban poor. Massive property and wealth transfers may take place from low middle class households to global funds and the rich. The pandemic may also affect transport modes, land use and urban sprawl as the extended use of electric this time cars in private transportation will increase pressures uh, in uh, congested metropolitan areas. At the same time, uh, high-rise, high-density buildings in metro areas may be re-examined from the healthy, uh, health safety point of view. Uh, Suburbanization and peri-urbanization will intensify consuming, uh, co intensify consuming limited natural resources and requiring additional public infrastructure and services. Uh, the, the pandemic is uh, expected to affect uh, unbalanced urban growth in a number of ways. On uh, the one hand, high density metropolitan areas may see their advantages to be challenged due to the fear of contagion. And smaller cities and suburban or peri-urban areas may appear with a safety related advantage and attract population from large agglomerations. On the other hand, ICT production uh, relate, ICT production related activities will remain in large cities with a significant knowledge base where major academic and research institutes are located. As a result, divides in space may become more visible between spaces of ICT production and spaces of ICT consumption. Uh, the, the pandemic may also affect public space. The public, uh, the public sector may appear as the main driver of recovery, helping cities to maintain their fabric during the crisis, while public goods like 
open green space or the quality of health services in the cities may become more important. Or, on the other hand, public debts will explode globally, leading to either further austerity programs or to increasing pressure for debt relief initiatives that may give more room for public intervention in the cities. Finally, national administrations may emerge stronger, but they will not become more effective unless they choose to empower the local level in order to deal with the footprint of the crisis at the city level. As a final note, I will say that uh, the pandemic crisis may affect the way people interact in space and therefore may have an impact on our theoretical basis for analyzing the formation of cities. It may set the ground for a new type of agglomeration economies in the age of smart cities, where positive externalities accrue from the participation of cities in a wide nexus of globally dispersed high order functions and networks of productive, social, cultural, and science-based activity. It may also generate demand for buildings, neighborhoods, and cities that are closer to the human scale of social interaction and in a better balance with the surrounding natural environment. The pandemic may lead to a more sustainable and more balanced network of urban places if agglomeration economies evolve to a less centripetal force or to a more unbalanced to more unbalanced hierarchies if divides in ICT and R&D capabilities over space prevail. In any case, it will open the discussion for a more sustainable ICT-led mix of production activities across the various special scales along a production, production continuum where urban agriculture and rural manufacturing are equally feasible. Thank you. Thank you, George, very much indeed for giving the economics uh, perspective on uh, urban development. And now uh, let's pass to the mayor, Kostas Bakoyanis. Costa. Well, good evening from Athens, and thank you so much for the invitation. It is indeed a privilege to join such a distinguished panel. And of course, I would like to thank the one and only Kevin Featherstone, a friend of many years, and also publicly thank uh, Ricky Bartet not only for his uh, insightful and mind-opening uh, presentation, but also for the uh, cooperation we have established, which is extremely constructive and helpful uh, for the city and in our day-to-day -day job. Now, I would like to raise five points, if I may, as quickly as possible. Number one, I think the key question is whether we're going to bounce back or whether we're going to bounce forward. Because I understand that there is this sense that uh, we are suddenly going to awaken from a long sleep, from a long hibernation, and find ourselves back in February of 2020. Well, this is clearly not the case. Um, history has been written in the past uh, 12 months. A lot has happened a lot that maybe we're not able to understand right now, but clearly the pandemic has been a catalyst. However, I think that we have to be a bit careful with making some predictions, or if I may say so, wild predictions about the future. Uh, I must be very open and very transparent. I don't share the dystopian uh, assumptions that find ourselves as you know, animals in an animal farm or that the big brother is watching over our shoulder. Uh, on the contrary, I think that if one compares the response to the pandemic in Europe, at least, to other regions of the world, especially in the East, uh, as Europeans, we can be extremely proud about how we actually protected our democratic integrity um, and actually strengthened our values. At the same time, I understand that there's this prevailing discussion. I've been reading some articles in the international press about the death of the city. Well, you know, this reminds me of Mark Twain's uh, famous quote. When, I, when some newspaper at the time actually wrote, reported his death, he responded by saying that uh, reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. I think this is a case for the city. 
Um, it's not just that going back to, you know, ancient Mesopotamia, um, th cities have been the actual epicenters and nucleus of human culture and human civilization. It's much more than that. I think what history actually teaches us is that pandemics have been opportunities for city transformation. Um, one can go the most romantically inclined, us, inclined amongst us can go back to you know, the Black Death and the Renaissance that followed, but one doesn't need to go that far back in the past. Um, the response to the Spanish flu was the Gilded Age and the Empire State Building was actually built, if I'm not mistaken, or completed, if I'm not mistaken, in 1930. So I think that there is plenty of ground for optimism. At least I should make this footnote based on Ricky's presentation, at least for countries, for cities in Europe, in the United States, um, and maybe in parts of Asia. Because what we are actually experiencing right now with vaccination uh, is a growing global uh, inequality, some kind of a vaccination apartheid, uh, some reports coming out of the African Union um, note that they will probably get to 60% of vaccinations in four or five years uh, with whatever that means for the reversal of the mega trends that Ricky described earlier on, at least in certain parts of the world. Having said all that, uh, the pandemic clearly uh, brought us face to face with some structural issues, um, inequalities amongst these that we have been facing for a very long time. These are, of course, the socioeconomic cleavages. Uh, things are actually worse in Athens right now, Ricky, uh, than um, are presented in uh, the otherwise excellent work done by Professor Malutas in the Athens Social Atlas. Um, this, if I'm not mistaken, the data comes from 2010, 2011. Uh, you can just imagine after another decade of financial hardship and crisis where we are right now, but also um, it has brought us face to face with a growing uh, climate, with the consequences of climate change, or to put it differently, of a climate emergency. Now, my second point, our vision in Athens, interesting, interestingly, is not different than the vision of most mayors I've actually spoken to um, around the world. We all want to go back to, or to help, um, create green um, and equitable cities. And in this context, as Ricky rightly mentioned, uh, the high density of the city of Athens is both a strength and a weakness. So we have three strategic goals. Number one, to reclaim or liberate public space, quality public space. Athens right now has three records. We have the most square meters in our apartments per capita, so we basically have the biggest apartments or houses per capita. Number two, we have the most square meters of asphalt per capita. Number three, we have the, le we have the least uh, square meters of, of greenery per capita. So clearly that shows us where we have to go. Number two, we want to talk, we, wa we actually want to move forward and to a new model of sustainable mobility. The statistics, 72% uh, of car drivers, I'm afraid, haven't improved over the last few years, rather on the contrary. So that means that we want to find a new balance between the right of drivers, the rights of passengers, the rights of pedestrians, uh, the rights of cyclists. And number three, which is extremely important and which you mentioned as well, is that we want Athens to change without losing its soul. The this peculiar, unique DNA of the city, this authenticity the city has, is its great strength moving forward. We, we don't want Athens to, you know, to become some sort of an ancient Greek theme park. Um, uh, we are not compared to Dubai. We are not even compared to Elinikon, for the Greeks who may be watching, um, who, which is much closer. Athens is Athens. Athens is not even the new Berlin. Athens is a new Athens, and that must be very, very clear. Now, number three, and that's my third point, Athens has lost a lot of time. Uh, usually, uh, we talk about the financial and the economic crisis, and of course, we are right. 
Uh, usually we talk about how this crisis has been exasperated because of the refugee and immigration flows, and we are right. Uh, and usually we like to underline that uh, the pandemic came at a particularly cruel time, uh, just when Athens was emerging from the crisis, from the financial crisis with a newly found sense of optimism um, and self-confidence. And I think we're we are right when we make this analysis. However, there is one important point missing, which Ricky mentioned, that before the, uh, the pandemic, before the economic crisis, before the immigra immigrant immigration and refugee pressures, we had our own very peculiar, very unique urban crisis. Two out of five Athenians have left the city since 2000. They didn't leave in 2000, just in 2015, 2017, 2012. They began leaving in 2000. And at least compared to London, I'm afraid uh, the Olympics have been a wasted opportunity. So that brings me to my fourth point, that that means that we don't have any time to lose, no time whatsoever. And we cannot afford to let another crisis become an excuse or an alibi. Athens has to come into the 21st century, even if it is paradoxical to talk about the 21st century in the year 2021, because basically we have lost two, de two decades. And our, uh, and our, road, um, our road plan, our roadmap, is based on the principle of social infrastructure. Social, for, social infrastructure is based on the idea that pub, a public space is a public good, that uh, it's a public good that actually brings people together, uh, unites people, bridges socioeconomic or other differences, and builds social capital. And of course, we're working bottom up. Uh, there is no project, there may well be a project that's too big, but there is no project that's too small. Um, I could mention a number of examples from the so-called double rejuvenation uh, that uh, involves uh, the creation of two metropolitan um, points of reference in Botanico and in Lofora Alexandras. That's an example of a big project to the pocket parks that we are completing as we speak, which are examples of small projects. I could mention pedestrianization we actually um, employed the theory and the methodology of tactical urbanism in Athens, also known, I understand, as playgrounds. Um, however, it's a theory that works. Um, we already see the results, bo both in terms of mobility um, and in terms of improving the environment. Uh, we give a special emphasis to green areas, to our green lungs, uh, whether it's the National Garden or uh, the Streffy Hill or uh, Plato's Academy. And at the same time, we're trying to focus a lot on the daily life of Athenians, which I think is extremely important to make sure that the Athenians deliver the services that they actually deserve. Now, I could go on and on, but let me uh, end with my final point, which is about governance. Uh, Ricky, uh, very rightly, um, underlined the importance of good governance. Um, in our case, in Athens, I want to be very honest about it, it things are worse than in other cities. It's not just about uh, who does what, it's about how many do what. Uh, let me give you an example. When we're talking about mobility, traffic congestion, uh, public transport, mobility in general, over 10 different authorities are involved. And as we speak, uh, there isn't any institutional coordination because as you understand, bureaucracies tend to operate within, within silos and we actually try our best and we are extremely happy when we manage to bring them around the table and actually help them communicate. So let me end uh, with this. Cities around the world are in a global race. It's a global race for investment, for visitors or tourists, and for talent, human talent, because the economy, as uh, 
as Professor Petrako said, has changed. Athens has joined this race and we're trying our best to make up for the, all the lost time. Once again, thank you so much for the conversation. It's uh, extremely interesting. Thank you, Costa. Uh, thank you, Mayor, for uh, joining us and uh, making those very uh, valuable contributions. Uh, we have a lot of questions and we've got a lot of people uh, watching us uh, and we're going to be short of time. So I'm going to uh, suggest to my colleagues at the LSE that we will extend uh, the discussion. But nevertheless, uh, when I pose the questions, uh, I would encourage you to be as brief as you possibly uh, can. Uh, Ricky, uh, perhaps I could start with uh, with you. One of the clear themes which has come out uh, from uh, today's discussion is about the impacts of the pandemic on our sense of public space. Um, Leela mentioned about uh, a sense of a dead city, and I know that the mayor um, uh, responded to that uh, that point, but um, what do you think may last from the COVID pandemic in terms of our sense of public space for urban planning? Uh, could you perhaps look beyond the immediate and think of uh, what may be the ramifications of the pandemic uh, for public space planning beyond that? Well, of course, everyone is right to point to the fact that public space, the gathering of individuals who don't know each other all that well. Richard Sennett, the urban sociologist, has written extensively about cities, about mixing uh, people in crowds and actually nearly touching each other but not knowing who you are. And you know, that, at the moment, as you could say, has uh, been questioned. But I would say the value of public space has actually gone way up the food chain in terms of significance, right? I don't think Nilo Georgios or, or Costas or I could disagree on that. Uh, it's been used in different ways, but the fact that every single family and particularly those Lila who live in the congested environments without, uh, without natural airflows anywhere in the world, not, not, not just in the fortunate um, uh, Europe, uh, will feel that more than anywhere else. So Kevin, I would say, that um, the, there is a continuity and I'm a strong believer and, and I think a, a number of the speakers have alluded to this. It, it's not that the pandemic has made us stop and start again or turn 180 degrees. There are a few things which are, uh, we, we need to amplify and accelerate. And one of them is designing cities or retrofitting cities like Athens, frankly, which haven't done, uh, haven't paid enough attention to these things. That too much has been grabbed by the private sector. Leela uh, articulated that in very, very clear ways. And George talked about the economic processes at hand. Therefore, the public sector taking in hand the planning of the city and regulating the amount and location of public space. If you look at those final maps I just showed you of Athens, which identified, and Costas knows this, but hasn't seen the map, so it's new, where the public spaces are in relation to where the density of the population are, there's so much more than actually can be done. And what we found in London, Kevin, and I will conclude, is that the 19th century tradition, 19th century tradition, of actually having large parks where most of the more deprived population live, not just in the posh West, but also in the Poor East, and I'm thinking of Victoria Park, and I would add, uh, slightly patting myself on the back, the, the, the uh, Queen Elizabeth Park, as it's called now, the Olympic site, which is in one of the most deprived areas of London, those open spaces and parks and smaller places also have served well. Equally in Spain, Italy, elsewhere, the public space, the, sh the, 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 the piazza, as we saw in the Milan, uh, example have been significant. So I think embedding that uh, sanctity <laughs> of the public realm, and then of course, going back to Lila and Giorgos' point, ensuring that they are democratically accessible is significant because if they are policed and controlled or privatized, that's a completely different story, but. Okay. Perhaps leading from that, uh, Ricky, 
uh, there's also uh, questions coming in about transport and of course in a moment there's going to be a question to the mayor about uh, transport and adaptation but um, as several people have already said, people, uh, one of the impacts of the pandemic is people are working from home, we're all becoming um, isolated in our homes and we're uh, mobile. Uh, George Petrakos mentioned about the mobility of labor in this uh, respect with ICT. So do you think one of the lingering impacts of the pandemic, uh, Ricky, will be in terms of adjusting our planning for transport? Well, I, I think, again, this is where we really need to look at this in, in a global perspective. There are large parts of the world, and think of those first images I showed you of the concentration of urbanization in Africa and Asia, <clears throat> large parts of the world where some of the uh, uh, ref, uh, frame, frames of reference that we've been using in the last hour don't apply, uh, where a, a small percentage of people can actually do knowledge work and a very large percentage of people can't afford not to go to work. If you're a cleaner or a worker in some industry, there is no option for you not to get, probably in a, uh, an old bus, which fueled with diesel, uh, which takes hours to get you to work. So I think that that's an important consideration. You know, much of the urbanization doesn't have the sort of planning that we are fortunate uh, enough to have. Then okay. turning to the positive side of that question, can we retrofit existing systems to be safer and less polluting? Uh, there is already evidence that actually, um, even in London and certainly in New York, the number of uh, people who are using public transport is increasing post-vaccine. That's going to make a massive difference uh, for sure. Uh, and that also work patterns will change so that there won't be the concentration, uh, you know, whatever the rush hour period is. Uh, in other words, the changing in work practices will affect the way that the transport systems themselves actually deal with the, the peaks. So I, I think, Kevin, there are certainly ways of being imaginative and creative in replanning the system, but density around good public transport. That's also the notion around the 15 minute city, I think is an essential model. Well, thank you for that. There are many questions coming in uh, for the mayor, but um, I'm just going to ask you, uh, Costa, on one particular question here in terms of transport, and then I'm going to try to bring everyone in with other questions. Uh, there's been several questions, uh, Mayor, in terms of uh, Athens and the challenges it faces. Uh, a question about a greater use of uh, electric buses or um, a new policy of road pricing. Uh, road pricing policies thin out traffic, reduce air pollution and provide funds for public transport. Is this a possibility for Athens, was the question. So perhaps you could respond on both points about transport. Well, um, let me begin by saying that the state of public transport in the city of Athens is truly shameful. Um, of course, there's a historical explanation. Um, I think the first underground uh, tube station in London was built in, the 86, in, the, in 1863 or something. Uh, while in Athens, uh, the first actually uh, metro station was completed in the year 2000. Um, but still, um, things are extremely difficult. We you have all stuff on the ground. We got, we've got literally everything on the ground, including tons of cars, which is a problem. Um, and why is it a problem? And now I'm speaking uh, for the city of Athens and not for Attica. Uh, right now, uh, according to the study, of uh, the Metsovia University, uh, right now, over 70% of cars that come through the, city, the center of Athens are not moving to the city of Athens as a destination. So for the Greeks who are actually watching, someone may start from Halandri and go to Peristeri through Panepistimiu. Now, no city in the world, no city in the world can tolerate that and at the same time uh, offer a quality of life to its citizens, uh, to its visitors, or to those 
while employed within the city. That's why we desperately, desperately need to find a new balance. Um, and this new balance, of course, involves um, using and employing uh, new means of transport. Um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the OASA, which is the agency that's responsible for buses, has already moved forward with the first electric buses in Athens. Right now, they are more, you know, exhibitory in nature, but I hope that they will soon uh, become more and more. At the same time, um, the city is moving forward and we're actually um, implementing a project of placing electric chargers for electric cars um, in the city center and giving also a number of um, incentives for people to use these amongst these that you don't pay um, a parking fee. Uh, now, uh, the, situation, the conversation about um, a general fee, much like there is one in London, uh, I think it's called a traffic congestion fee. I don't, I'm not sure, Kevin, what's the right term that you guys use? Well, that's the congestion charge. Yeah, the congestion charge. I think it's um, a bit far from our mentality as we speak. Uh, before we actually you know, try to get to the moon, we have to learn to crawl um, and walk first. Thank you. That's a very precise answer. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, uh, George, there's questions coming in about the factors uh, that might potentially arrest uh, growth. Um, Edward White asks, will we see more factors uh, reversing the growth in urban cities in the future, or is the pandemic just a, uh, a singular um, impact? Might we see other things which could arrest the, the growth of cities, do you think? Well, uh, uh, I tried to present the major factors that uh, the literature uh, considers as uh, drivers of urban growth, like uh, agglomeration, globalization, structural change, uh, policy, and environmental considerations. Um, many, of, many of them will be affected by the pandemic, but uh, not uh, all cities will feel the same effect uh, all, and uh, in, in the same way. Uh, in, my, in my feeling, uh, it's, it's not so much, uh, the pandemic is not so much a, a challenge for the process of uh, urbanization itself, uh, but it's a challenge for the process of urban concentration, uh, we, which is not so much uh, uh, a serious problem in Europe, but if you go to uh, Asia, you will uh, meet cities of 30 and 40 million people uh, that, uh, in fact, are, are not real cities, uh, in a sense that they have uh, skyscrapers of 100 or 150 floors uh, everywhere. So uh, these uh, urban concentrations, or uh, urban concentrations, uh, uh, were, like uh, Ricky said, 30% uh, of the residents live in slums. Uh, they will be affected uh, somehow. Um, uh, so uh, I think the, the solution to countries that have a very concentrated urban system is that urbanization, of course, continues because uh, it's a natural process goes with growth and uh, development, but it will take a more local and regional term, uh, turn. Uh, instead of implying that people move to the uh, richest city or the biggest city, uh, it might be uh, urbanization at the local level where people uh, move from villages to towns and cities uh, in, their, uh, in their vicinity. Uh, which will be more healthy and uh, e easier to plan and uh, 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 less demanding in terms of uh, expanding uh, infrastructure and uh, public services. Thank you. Leela, if I may, there's a, a question here about uh, the impact on city life in Athens of um, so many migrants entering uh, the city and the challenges of incorporating them into the life of the, uh, the city. A reference here to an unregulated ghetto that has appeared between Ammonia and uh, Anopatissia. 
um, questions of how a city can integrate such a diverse uh, community. Um, integration in terms of relig religious uh, practice, education, social facilities, etc. And there's a specific uh, aspect here which is raised in terms of the dominance of the Orthodox Church in such social integration. What kind, how, what kind of challenge do you think this is for a city like Athens uh, handling large numbers of migrants? Well, Kevin, I think you are begging my pessimism again, because this is a really, really uh, thorny problem for policy, which is not addressed now during the pandemic at all. And in fact, uh, about pessimism, I thought uh, I, I had to say this, that my hero is uh, Antonio Gramsci, who pointed out pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. So the will will be to, to deal with this problem, which is left in the darkness, and uh, to uh, exercise some proactive planning instead of decorating the city. And also, I mean, I wouldn't uh, um, expect to agree with the mayor, but uh, referring to Plato's Academy and Streffy and the privatization of public spaces would be detrimental for migrants. There, is, uh, there are a lot of public spaces uh, where they swarm and uh, problems are created in the center of Athens. Um, I don't know why they are so invisible right now during the pandemic. I suppose uh, uh, tests and uh, COVID uh, uh, you know, uh, expansion does not uh, affect them or is it just that they don't do any tests? Uh, the policy to, to deal with this problem is a complicated and uh, multi-diverse policy, which uh, I cannot, uh, uh, you know, uh, stand on right now. But the thing is that we have to divert funds from this uh, tendency to, to make the city a, a pleasant playground to social policy, welfare policy, transport, as you said before, and uh, all the amenities that would uh, reduce uh, social inequalities and integrate people into the society. I don't know if I have any time to, to expand. No, no, that, that, we are tight for time. Can I uh, come back to, um, to the mayor? Um, that particular question was uh, posed by uh, Michael Moskos, and actually he says, what is the mayor doing to incorporate into the life of the city migrants inhabiting the ghetto, and does he offer religious education on, and social facilities to help their incorporation, or are you constrained by the influence of the Orthodox Church? Wow. So um, let me first of all say the following. Um, I'm in love with local government. And one of the reasons that I'm in love with local government is that it's about real life. It's about practical solutions. It's about getting tangible, visible results. So I fully understand that many of us uh, enjoy um, turning anything into you know, an ideological or political or partisan struggle, uh, but that's not my role. Um, and I also fully understand that it's very easy in politics to, for example, you know, demonize the public sector or demonize the private sector and just, you know, draw a line in the sand. But at the end of the day, it's about all of us learning to work together. Um, it's about all of us joining forces. Um, the reason I'm saying this is because uh, with all due respect, I would like to correct uh, Professor Leondidou. Um, there is no, no privatization whatsoever of any public space in the city of Athens. None. Interesting. Zero. And I've said so publicly many times. Now, we don't know each other. I don't know why you 
uh, enter a conversation having made the working assumption that by definition you won't agree with me. I, on the contrary, enter this conversation uh, with the working assumption that I may agree with you. So let's talk about facts. Okay. No conversation well, ever. Now, let me move though to the key question. About migrants. It has to do with uh, refugees and migrants. The truth is that right now, uh, a considerable percentage of Athenians, um, and I'm being very deliberate about my choice of words, uh, a considerable percentage of Athenians are born outside Athens. For us, they have the same rights um, and the same obligations as all Athenian citizens. So practically, the city of Athens right now, I can mention a number of examples, is actually doing more than any other European capital um, when it comes to integration. And that's an argument that I make when I meet my European colleagues. Let me just, for example, uh, say that we are the only uh, capital in Europe that has a um, refugee center within our urban uh, space. Right now, as we speak, we're actually creating a second transition center for those who come from the island so they don't end up sleeping on squares. At the same time, the city of Athens is running a number of projects. Most of them uh, are, get, are aimed towards integration, but we do face a considerable challenge that has to do with the fact that there are certain neighborhoods in areas of Athens that have reached a tipping point, meaning that there are too many refugees and immigrants, then they can actually uh, integrate and that they're, we're losing the sense of social balance with whatever that entails for social cohesion. Uh, last quick point, uh, the Church of Greece, um, at least in Athens, is not an obstacle whatsoever. On the contrary, uh, the Church of Greece is an ally. Uh, they number, they run a number of hostels themselves. Uh, just to mention a quick anecdotal example, when uh, over Christmas, we asked the Church of Greece because um, in the parishes, they actually gave out food for, the, for those most in need to give us the lists so we can actually send food, deliver food to homes since people could not leave their homes um, and go somewhere. 50% um, of the families that they gave us were born outside Athens. I think that on its own says a lot. Well, thank you. I can also add uh, from personal knowledge that the cooperation between the Orthodox Church in Athens and churches of other denominations uh, has improved substantially um, as a result of first the debt crisis and now the pandemic. So uh, we should uh, note that. Um, I am conscious of time. There's a, a couple of questions, if I may, uh, directly to the, the mayor in terms of the Athens uh, experience. Uh, inevitably, there's a, a question about the um, project which you championed in terms of the pedestrian uh, walkways and the criticism of um, what one questioner refers to as uh, the failure. Um, a project which uh, the question says uh, came from um, little planning uh, and the project being too, uh, too rushed. George Samaras asks whether Greek taxpayers are going to have to pay the debt of the failure of uh, this pedestrian um, project. Uh, we don't want to get into Parabestimi or, or any particular location, but just in general, uh, uh, what do you think are the lessons to be learned from uh, the pedestrian project you, you championed? Well, um, I think Ricky is much better than I am, and certainly much more persuasive than I am, to, to explain the methodology of tactical urbanism, which we actually employed. He made reference to this uh, methodology um, in a slide of his presentation. Uh, where are we right now? We have a project that's in two phases. Uh, the first phase was the so-called pilot phase. We already, uh, we have learned a lot, including for example, uh, that traffic has been normalized uh, in the city center, despite the fact that we see a spike uh, because of the pandemic. We also learned, for example, that CO2 emissions in Panipstimiu, uh, since you mentioned Panipstimiu, have dramatically uh, fallen 
over 20 to 25%. So now we are about to embark on the second phase, which is to actually cre create a high quality uh, public space. Um, the money uh, that was spent, at least the money that was invested for the city to purchase uh, the necessary so-called urban furniture uh, is not going to be lost. Not one euro is going to be lost because uh, these um, uh, plants and uh, the urban furniture will find its place in the neighborhoods of Athens. Uh, we all agree that we want uh, more green uh, across the city, not just in the city center. Thank you uh, for that. Um, just a moment, if I may. Uh, there's a further question, um, Costa, in terms of uh, the budget and governance. Ricky was emphasizing the uh, tremendous importance of uh, getting jurisdiction, governance, budgets uh, aligned, uh, etc. Uh, and you have also referred to the complexity of getting different institutions to collaborate. Um, your head of a population greater than that of Slovenia or Cyprus or different member, st member states of the European Union. But um, I wonder whether you would uh, envisage um, some reform in your competencies uh, in the uh, upcoming um, period or in the longer term, and to what extent these institutional restrictions in terms of your competences actually uh, are a major factor in determining whether uh, your planning will succeed for the city? Um, well, this is a, a huge conversation that needs to be had. Uh, and I'm very sorry to say that it's not being had in Greece as we speak. Um, when we talk about local government in Greece, uh, over the past three or four years, at least since 2017 or 18, we talk about the electoral law as if that's the big problem um, of those who actually vote for us. Um, this conversation has two levels, broadly speaking. Number one, uh, the independence and the autonomy of local government, which basically uh, starts and ends with being responsible for our own finances. Um, right now we have this, if I may call it, um, quote unquote, Ottoman system, where um, mayors and heads of region um, from around Greece have to go uh, to you know, a minister or to a prime minister, whoever is in charge, uh, and you know, hold out their hand and ask for money. Um, we need to grow up. We need to mature, uh, which means that we need to be responsible uh, both for collecting the funds um, and for distributing the funds. Um, number two, uh, we need to be very clear about jurisdictions. Um, there are many paradoxes right now in the city of Athens. The Greeks who have been following, who are following us know many of them. Um, there are roads in Athens where you know uh, the city uh, where the region of Athens, the region of Attica is responsible for the asphalt, uh, while the uh, Athens administration, the city of Athens is responsible for the sidewalk, um, and uh, uh, ADAP, uh, the water authority, is responsible for, you know, the, the, the infrastructure. Now, this just doesn't work. It's crazy. Uh, we need to be very, very clear about who is responsible for what, uh, and we need to have both conversations um, on both points without uh, party or political agendas, because at the end of the day, um, you know, there is this cross-partisan um, and cross ideological uh, tendency um, in Greece. I mean, I've been in local government now for 11 or 12 years, and I've seen it with all governments that once, uh, you know, a central state or a government that has, you know, full authority and full power about everything and about everyone, um, and treats uh, local government as, uh, you know, unaccompanied um, adults, uh, children, as unaccompanied children, much like when we send our children to travel from point A to point B. Um, so hopefully we'll have these conversations and we'll have them very, very soon. We are running out of time, but let me squeeze in uh, a question for uh, Ricky, if I may. 
Um, how important for the prosperity of a city, do you think, is the presence and density of younger residents, students included in those cities, uh, as opposed to public and private workers? Uh, I think the question is essentially um, the age distribution of this, of the demographic. How important uh, is it having a younger um, demographic of a city? The short answer is 100%. Uh, the, the long answer is that, um, or the medium, is that if you look at most European cities, let alone Asian cities like Seoul or Tokyo, uh, the, there is an imbalance with people from, uh, Kevin, your age and my age and upwards, um, sort of uh, very much drawing on the uh, resources, the services, and the costs of uh, what the city is about. Without younger people, not just students, even though that is absolutely uh, critical and helpful, younger people involved in the uh, supply chain, and of course, Yorgos was in a way implying that, and that's one of the risks of what might happen next. Um, and you know, I would add, not just the pandemic, but decisions like Brexit in, in our country, remember, let's not forget about that the impact that that will have on young European workforce coming uh, easily into, let's say, the London economy, not to mention elsewhere, could be uh, incredibly uh, negative, frankly. I mean, in the end, Kevin, cities are about trade-offs. You're, you're, ne you're never going to get the five of us happy. Uh, you're never going to get our audience happy. They, they, they have to accommodate completely different um, uh, sort of agendas as we've just heard, in many ways, we're talking about what do young people need in the city for it to be attractive. They need cheap accommodation, close to funky places where you can make noise. Then the minute they get a bit older, they need to be close to what? A good school and ideally an affordable state run school. And then what? You know, things change. Your needs change over a lifetime. And cities need to be equally resilient to accommodate in a way these different changes. And I think. Many of the very big points made by Lila and Yorgos don't originate, let's call it the negative issues, sorry, societal issues that you were, the, don't necessarily originate in cities. They're broad social conditions to deal, deal with neoliberalism, uh, the excesses of the capitalist state, and so we go on, or the mismanagement of uh, the democratic state for that matter. But I would, conclude by saying, Kevin, that many of the solutions can be found at the city level to some of these problems. Because a little bit what Costa was saying, that you've got to deal with the problem very locally. You've got to deal with the street curb if someone trips over it. I'm exaggerating. You've got to deal with uh, a critical issue of uh, supply of health services or elsewhere. So in that sense, I'm not being naive by saying that I see despite where we are in the cycle, which obviously Lila and George are uh, noting, you know, the cities are under threat, that their ability to respond already is proving, I think, uh, a degree of innovation and capability uh, and therefore uh, social, economic and spatial resistance. Okay, thanks. We are um, unfortunately out of time. Uh, I think we've covered many different aspects, both international and uh, Athenian. Um, let me say that uh, the recording of this discussion will be available on the website of the Hellenic Observatory, as indeed uh, podcasts of our previous events are, are available for your uh, download. Um, can I just quickly uh, say that the next lecture in the series with the National Bank of Greece will be on the 15th of April at uh, 6 p.m. Greek time. And that is with uh, Professor Oriana Bandera uh, talking about inequality, the misallocation of talent and economic development. Before that, I will be in conversation uh, with Evkadis Zakalotos on the 22nd of March at, again, at 6 p.m. Uh, Greek time, discussing the left in power reflections on Syriza's promise and achievements. But let me uh, thank on your behalf, 
each of our uh, speakers, Ricky Burdett for his uh, presentation, Yorgos Petrakos and Lila Leontido for their response, and special thanks to the mayor of Athens, and yes, my friend Kostas Bakiganis. Wherever you're watching us, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for the many questions. I'm sorry I wasn't able to get through more of them, uh, but stay safe, stay well, and join us for the next LSE public event. Thank you. Bye.